Okay, well, let's let's get started with a, a brief. Thanks, thanks, Wendy. Thanks. Um, let's get started with a brief introduction, real quick. Um, that way, um, people kind of know who who is speaking and, <laughs> and where we're coming from. So, um, my name is Nana Kofinti, um, and I'm a co-owner of Five T Media Behavior Five T Media which is a behavior science branding firm. Um, I'm considered what you, I'm, I'm what you consider a knowledge worker. So we are hired quite often to go out and, and solve other people's problems and uh, nudge human behavior and figure out uh, different ways to create installations or branding that can shape human behavior. Um, Corey, you want to do an introduction of yourself real quick? Sure. My name is Courtney Smith. I'm a co-founder of an athletic brand called Courtsmith. Um, I've, I've been running this particular brand for eight years. Uh, I've been in this uh, entrepreneur space for about 22 years. So uh, running various athletic brands or um, um, wearable technology company, but mostly in consumer athletic wear. And now we currently but build brands for athletes and NBA players um, in the NIL space. So, uh, and, and we do this basically um, just to advance our culture and we want to stake a claim in helping athletes create and generate wealth for themselves on the ascend and descend of their athletic careers. So, uh, Fight Team Media, uh, we've been in business for 17 years. About six, six to seven years ago, um, we were having huge impact and, um, and with companies and government, um, nonprofits, combination of all. And uh, we realized that there was a need for uh, a, a business course for entrepreneurs that were ran, number one, ran by entrepreneurs based upon um, behavior economics and multidiscipline thinking. And so we created this program called Hope, which is this is a green screen, but behind me, this is the backdrop of the, our online class. That's a year course or a year program um, dedicated to teaching teaching entrepreneurs um, about business, but from a behavior science and using multidisciplinary thinking. Um, and so, with that being said, we're going to give you a quick, I mean, a very fast. Uh, um, course are uh, uh, we're going to expose you to the first portion of our class so in our first in our class the way it's structured is the first three months we focus on engineer re uh, re-engineering your belief system and then the second month the next three months we focus on emotional intelligence and the ego and then from that point on from that point forward we focus on an introduction of introduction of mental models and business strategies and so um, what we're going to do is attempt to summarize the first three months in less than 30, 40 minutes. And the reason we're going to keep that time short, we want to give time for you guys to ask questions. So what I suggest is uh, make sure you take notes because we're going to move kind of fast. And we're going to start off with a very, very philosophical subject um, that's going to allow you to then understand the, the rapid fire last session of our presentation. Um, so with that being said, um, let's move on to the first slide. I'm operating two systems here, so I have my notes in front of me and have the computer. So if you see me pause, it's because I'm working two systems and trying to still think. So here we go. Um, so there's this famous saying um, by Marshall McCullen. He's a... Um, He's a famous Canadian philosopher that uh, we use for um, uh, his media theories. He's very, very famous amongst a lot of people in the media industry. And we use a lot of his principles um, to kind of develop some of our, our methodologies. And one of the things that he mentioned, he says, once you see the boundaries of your environment, they are no longer the boundaries of your environment. What we're gonna try to attempt to illustrate to you in this presentation that majority of the boundaries that are the more majority of the boundaries that you're facing is not the outside world, it's your beliefs. And we're going to show you the importance of why it's important to be able to reframe, reshape, um, and become aware of your belief system. 
Next, um, another point that is uh, that I want to bring to your attention is this phrase here that says, opportunities are all around, are around you all the time. Most of them are invisible because you are focusing on other things. So there's a popular myth that opportunities are rare, right? Or you're lucky if you have an opportunity or you, or you receive an opportunity. Uh, but actually, opportunities, what we discovered um, is opportunities around you all the time, but often we're quite distracted. Quick business, is, quick business example, what they discovered is that most companies are more creative when they're struggling. And why is that? It's because when they're struggling, they become more curious for solutions and they find a lot of opportunities. But when they're doing, but when they're very, very successful, they have a tendency to be to see less opportunities. Why? Because they have other things that are distracting them. So quite often, if we're if we're not um, um, experiencing a lot of opportunities in our life, it's often because we're distracted with other things. Like I said, we're going to move really, really fast. So some of you guys may have heard this story about the uh, blind man, the king, and the elephant, and and it's important that I. We tell this story so you guys can get a, can, um, kind of get a picture of where we're going. So it was this, hold on a second, let me slide my notes because I'm finding the wrong place. It was this great king, and this king called, had an elephant brought in um, to into a separate room, and he sent into the room a group of blind men. And he asked a blind man, do me a favor, can you tell me what sort of thing is an elephant? So one blind man, all the blind men surrounded the elephant and started to touch the elephant. And one blind man said, well, it's somewhat like a snake. Another man said, well, by touching his, 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 uh, his skin, it's somewhat like a wall. Somebody grabbed his tail and says, it's somewhat like a rope. The other one said, well, you know what? It, it, when he grabbed his leg, it's somewhat like a tree. When they grabbed his uh, ear, they said someone like a rug or a fan. Uh, when they grabbed his tusk, they, somebody said it's someone like a spear. So eventually, the, the blind man started to argue because they assumed that the other, they, they thought to themselves, well, you know, that's not true. This is what I see. And what was going on is that they all described the elephant from their personal experiences. None of them were wrong, but all of them had their own personal experiences. And the reason they started to argue because they started to believe that their personal experiences was the right experiences and everybody else's was wrong. Each one of those blind men, which this is a great, and the reason we use the term blind men, the reason is because at the end of the day, we're all somewhat blind to reality. All of our perceptions and all of our engagements in reality is just our own personal experiences with reality. Now imagine, if you're one of the blind men and you grab the tail and you say, wow, it feels like a rope. And then somebody says, no, nah, it feels like a spear. Both of you guys look at each other and think, what is wrong with this person? They're idiots. When they're actually not idiots, they just have a different perception of the same reality. Now, this is this is quite, 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 quite critical that uh, to understand that Quite often, most of us are blind because we all cannot own all of reality. All of us are all quite often arguing, arguing over our own particular perception of reality. And one of the reasons, one of the realities about one of the things about reality is that we we are now our hands can't touch every part of reality, our eyes can't see every part of reality, and our minds can't hold every part of reality. So, as human beings, we're automatically limited to our own perception. So the, the, the other thing to keep in mind, one of the reasons these men continue to argue is because they couldn't separate their own experiences from reality. Now, with that being said, Court. Yeah, so in entrepreneurship, this is critical. Uh, and we teach this in the whole class a lot, is that a lot of times we think our viewpoint of the world is the world's viewpoint, when it's actually just a tiny sliver. So. This, this, this uh, slide says having an elephant in our head is not the same as having an elephant in your mind, which means if you're in an entrepreneur space, you have to get out of your own head, your own ideas, what you like, what you think is cool, uh, because you have a customer base or a demographic that you want to serve and you have you. 
So some entrepreneurs, they say, well, I decided to start this company and I have this color because I like this color. Well, you, we, we challenge you to ask the question, well, does your customer like that color? Because if your customer don't like the color, it doesn't matter if, if you like it or not, because it's just still a hobby at that point. So um, our viewpoint is a tiny sliver. We never fully had a full picture. So it's important to have context over content. That's, the, that's what those blind men were missing, context. So asking, asking the question is, is this all there is of the elephant? Helps you gather more context to see the big picture. And then you can serve your customers better. So I want to talk about how beliefs are formed. And this is important because this is going to come up a lot as we move forward. Um, first of all, at the foundation of this illustration, this pyramid illustration as well, somewhat of a pyramid illustration, um, you have this real reality. Reality is absolutely unknowable for human beings. But in reality, human beings have our limited experiences that are constrained by time, life, whatever. We have limited experiences. From those limited experiences, for example, um, uh, you go into a supermarket. That's an experience, right? But from those limited experiences, you have extremely limited attention span. So what I mean by attention span is that the human brain is aware of 40 bits per second of data. Although there's potentially 11, billion, 11 million bits of information that's available to us. So we're only taking in a small slither of information as we have different experiences. So for example, if you went to a supermarket and you went to go shopping, um, if I ask you for a product that you weren't thinking about when you went into the supermarket, because of your limited attention span, you won't even know it exists. You do not see every product that's in a, uh, in, inside of a supermarket. You only pay attention to certain items that are relevant to you. And so you have a very, very thin attention span. Now, from that attention span, you form your theories and your judgments, your theories about life and your judgments, leaving out all that other data, leaving out the complexity of reality. And so at the end of the day, you have to understand that our individual experiences and our individual attention limits our, our, our belief capacity. Next, this is also important, mm -hmm. um, that your judgment and theories are also influenced by people around you. So for example, you develop a theory and then you talk to a friend and they share their theory, which enhances your theory, right? Based upon your attention span. However, you don't realize when they share their theory with you, it's coming from the same pyramid. So quite often, even though you're listening to other people, quite often you listen to people who also are faced with the same limitations. By default, the human brain can't see all things and know all things. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's part of how we survive. If we were to try to see everything, it would overwhelm us and we'd be frozen in our space. However, it is also something we have to see the, the limitations that, that comes along with it. And so at the end of the day, although we're, although we are in a position where we are, um, we consider ourselves to be extremely intelligent, it, our intelligence only functions within a circle. Keep going. So this is, I might come back to this model a few times because this is gonna come up in numerous different cases. Go ahead, Corey. Yeah, so at the end of that, it, it turns into your belief system. You guys may have, a lot of you may have studied or know about how belief systems work, but understand that once you, at the end of that, you create a belief system, and those beliefs are real to you. So you, they're they're real to you. They're just as real as your physical body, because they're your rules, they're your heuristics that you live by in order to move. And so the the affirmation of those beliefs happen every day because that's how you survive. And if you send signals to your subconscious mind. And your ego to say, hey, we survive with these beliefs, and that's what makes those beliefs stronger. But the issue is, as entrepreneurs, our goal is to constantly scale, constantly grow, constantly evolve, get better. So in order to do that, you always have to challenge those beliefs. You have to look into the context again of your life. If you're an entrepreneur or just in life, you can say, damn, I want more out of life. I want to be better. I want to get better. I want to generate more revenue, I want to expand my company or whatever. 
very few times do we do we go back to say, well, what beliefs do I have to shatter in order for that to happen? Or what beliefs do I have to shift in order for that to happen? Because the beliefs got you there based on all the data that's been inputted in your life. But at a certain point, you got to understand they're also constricting you. They're constraining you. Now they're your boundaries. So the same beliefs that could get you where you are will be the same belief that could jail you. And you have to be willing to, to at certain times, destroy those beliefs. Next. And once again, we're going to move. We're moving fast. And then we're going to leave plenty of room for questions so we can come back and, and analyze this a little deeper. Now, your beliefs are your gatekeeper. So the way the human brain works, and quite often what we seek out, is information that's pretty closely aligned or reinforces our current beliefs. So quite often when we're learning, all we're really doing is expanding that belief, that belief pyramid that we discussed earlier. We're not really trying to shift the axis. We're not trying to shift the, are trying to add virtual experiences. Quite often when we're looking for things that have already fit comfortable within our beliefs. Beliefs often become so personalized that we think the beliefs are us and we are the beliefs. Next, one second. This is very important. The map is not the terrain. Um, so, your brain ultimately, it, when you your beliefs is a map. So once again, you often we think our beliefs are reality. What we believe is real, but our beliefs are actually a, a map of the terrain that we're actually going to, which is reality. The, ter the territory or terrain is actual reality, right? But the map that you have in your brain is not to the is not the terrain. But quite often, as human beings, we confuse the two. But once you and so why is this important? Quite often in life, when things are not going right, instead of us readjusting the map, we blame the terrain. So let me make this make it a little clear. Instead of adjusting our beliefs, we blame reality. So if we, we're going through life and things are not working out a certain kind of way, we don't say, Oh, I need to adjust my belief. We'll say, what's wrong with reality? Reality just should be this way. This is where the term should kicks in. And Anybody that understands neuroscience, I mean, behavior science, the term should is a cognitive distortion. I mean, when you use it, all you're doing is distorting your reality. And when you say it should be a certain kind of way, I would even argue that most people who go through life um, with this friction with life itself, it's not a friction with life. It's a friction with your map. Your map is telling you the way this is the way the world should be. And ultimately, you're frustrated with the world as opposed to accepting the world for what it is and then allowing you to, to adjust your map. Another phrase I heard somebody say a long time ago is that when they go somewhere new, they don't create expectations. Why they don't create expectations? That allows them to have a full experience for what their what their what's whatever they, whatever the experience is. But if you go to a certain land with expectations, you steal from the experience. Now we're moving fast. So I, once again, I'm going to keep rolling on this one. Next one. Um, so most of us cannot separate our experiences from reality. And this is very, 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 very important. So during COVID, we did a campaign around the mask. And one of the things we would hear in these big private rooms, I don't understand why people won't wear a mask. Or I don't understand why people won't take the vaccine shot. The people in that room didn't realize that their experiences was only their experiences. It's called the laws of relativity. So the laws of relativity says this. There's a guy in the bottom of a ship and he's bouncing a ball. And as he's bouncing the ball, he just he doesn't realize that the, the, the he's, he's just bouncing the ball because gravity and the speed of the boat is all adjusting. There's a guy on top of the ship that's watching the boat, the boat move and he's going, hey, this boat is moving at least 50, 60 miles per hour. There's somebody, this guy in a little rowboat where the boat's coming towards him. He's thinking this boat is moving way too fast. And there's a guy on the shore that's watching the boat that says, well, that boat's moving pretty slow. The reality is that they're all right, but they have different perspectives, similar to the elephant and the men arguing around the elephant. And so what you discover that quite often is when people from a central view say, why aren't other people doing this? They're often only listening to people within their group. And why listen to people within their group? They think that their experiences that they personally have experience of everybody else. And this is critical in business as we move forward. 
he rolled it. Go ahead, Court. The surprise is an opportunity to update your model. This is I, this I love this slide because a lot of times, especially in entrepreneurship, when things outside of the bell curve of our life happen, like exceptions or problems or events or things that take us off of our pivot, for example, um, most of us spend a lot of time uh, swimming around into the problem because we're shocked. And why did this happen in the world? Why happens a lot, right? But in entrepreneurship, uh, you almost got to throw the word why away because every time something like this happens, it's an opportunity for you to update your model or what we call upgrade our software which means you learn from it because once you learn from something and it's absorbed now into your psychology, now it's, it's there forever as long as you use it. And so um, most of the time, if we try to ignore it or put things back to the way they were, then a similar occurrence can happen again just in the cycle of life and you won't be prepared for it. So this is hell of important for mentally, emotionally, spiritually, Financially, physically, all of it is anytime what we call black swans happen. Um, that's Nassim Talib. He, he uh, wrote a book called Black Swans. And that's a great uh, analogy is that anytime a black swan occurs, something outside of your bell curve of understanding, it, um, it's your opportunity to learn from it. And it don't, it's not like it don't feel good. Shit's going to hurt. But, but as an entrepreneur or as a creative or progressive, if, if we're trying to push society or we're trying to help create change in our world or in our culture, then you have to get comfortable with surprises or things that hurt or, or what's uncomfortable for you. So in our conclusion, beliefs are models. Beliefs seem like perfect representation of the world, but in fact, they are imperfect models of navigating complex, multidimensional, unknowable reality. Let me say that again, this is so important. The imperfect models for navigating complex, multidimensional realities. Um, a friend of mine is kidding me last week and said, no, no, I wanna become an entrepreneur. She's been working on a job. I said, can I just share something with you before you get started? And she said, well, I need to call, I said, I need to caution you. So why do you need to caution me? I said, you know, when you have a job, your environment is very curated for you. Fairness is pretty strong. Certainty is very strong. Um, shoulds, rules, principles. They call it um, they call it single loop learning, which is, you know, here's a problem, here's a procedure, here's a solution. I said, but you know, you become an entrepreneur, the curation is gone. There's no curation. So a lot of times when people try to jump into the entrepreneur world. They're trying to take the beliefs of this very curated, institutionalized environment and shift it to this outside world. And what another example I gave her is that, which is going to go to my next point in a second, is that if you took somebody who's been institutionalized for 20 years, by the way, I grew up in East Oakland, been institutionalized for 20 years, and you put them in a suit and let them take a single class with their life change. Absolutely not. It takes it takes time for that individual to learn to think a different way and use different tools to navigate in a different reality, right? A different belief system. And so what happens quite often when people try to go from having a job to, um, to running their own business, one of the biggest challenges that people have is they don't wanna let go of their old beliefs that worked well for them when they were within that institution right? The job, the school you went to, or whatever. They don't realize that once you jump into this world of being entrepreneurs, you're going to have to change your belief system to align with the challenge of being an entrepreneur. So with that being said, we're going to jump in quickly and run through a, cult, a group of beliefs and distortions that are very, very common. So we can kind of give you some some grounding of where we've been going with this because it's been very philosophical. So now we'll get into some ground level uh, myths about business and things that have been said to you are things you hear all the time around you that sounds so good about business, but just nowhere near as true. And with that being said, let's 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 fly right through these real quick. First thing is first, <clears throat> being illusion of the self-help 
and all these entrepreneurial courses and books is that a lot, it sends the message that if you do everything right, you will be successful. It's the biggest distortion of your journey. Let me give you an example where really it's about compounded growth. So let me explain what I mean by this. Imagine if you go to the doctor and the doctor says, hey, you're, you're slightly overweight and you're in a danger zone of being diabetic. And you go to the gym and you work out super, super hard with the best trainer in the world. Does it have any impact? No, it doesn't. If you just do it one time, no, well, the impact of mentally wore you out, but physically, will it actually remove, put you in a different category as far as your diabetes? No. What's going to change your actual body condition is compounded training, compounded training, and over a over an extended amount of time, you start to see a change in your body shape and design. But if you only go to gym every, just you know, buy all the fancy clothes, go one time, and then it just has no value. Now, with that being said, there's something that was uh, that. Uh, um, Einstein said, compounding interest is the eighth wonder of the world. He also said, which I thought was wonderful, he, he who understands it, earns it. He who does it, pays it. In an entrepreneur, mm-hmm. in an entrepreneur culture, this is a story that is, called, is from this, uh, this king was wanting to, wanting to reward um, this person who had performed a great task for him. And he asked, he asked, the, person, he asked the person, what would you like? as a reward. And the person said, well, for this chessboard in front of us, I just want one grain of rice compounded for every square on this chessboard. The king had him killed. Why? Because if he did that, the king would have owed him, what was it, 18 quintillion pieces of rice, which is more rice than the world had, right? Which means he would have took over his kingdom. Um, another, another, just to wrap your mind around compounding, if you took a penny and compounded it for 30 days, it would be $10 million. So compounding is a very, so when you're building your career, it's not about checking boxes right, wrong, right, wrong, right, wrong, right, wrong. It's really about staying in the game. As you stay in the game, you grow, you evolve, you become more valuable, you become richer, and you achieve certain success. Um, a Warren Buffett, who everybody knows is one of the richest men in the world, made most of his wealth um, after six after being in the game for fifty years. The first fifty years, he was just an average investor, but through compounded growth, after sixty-seven, we saw this huge growth because up to that point, those experience had stacked up, the relationships had stacked up, his knowledge had stacked up, and eventually he got to a point he could move. At a, and so, another thing about compounding is. When you first start sending to the gym, you don't see any results. You don't see any results. You think, man, what, what is going on? But the longer you stay with it, you start to gain greater results on the back end. I'm going to keep going. Now, what could destroy compounded growth? And we're going to get into a few things. I'm going to take one, and I think course going to take one. Is you got to be constant. Going to the gym once a week and then skipping three days and going back to the gym again and skipping another four days and then going to the gym and skipping two months and then going to have another hard workout. It, they, they, by you having so many variations, you actually compromise. It's called variance drain in investing. By having so many variances in your, in your constants, you actually you lose the value of compounding. In order for compounding to work, you have, you have to be constant. You can't, it's like, it's the same, they gave a model of, you can't push a rock halfway up the hill, change your mind, go do something else. When you come back, the rock's all the way back to the bottom of the hill and you start over and over and over again and you get stuck in that in that, in that that cycle. So in order for you to actually benefit from compounded growth, um, then you have to be constant. So what I mean by that, this week, you probably had an opportunity to listen to a lot of different entrepreneurs talk about business, probably last couple of weeks. Um, if you're not always practicing and learning, like these these seminars should be used to enhance your learning, inspire your learning, and calibrate your learning. But they're just one day of your workout. They're not the workout. You're never going to go to any seminar and become successful. They're just a single day of your workout. 
This is why a lot of the people who are making money from this try to sell you this idea that if you come to my one class, I'm going to get you, I'm going to help you lose all this weight. No different if you take this pill, you'll lose 40 pounds. It's the exact same language. What you don't realize is that every time you take a class, it's one day of the workout. That means for, so for, for me personally, I study an hour and a half a day every day. Now, over 17 years, I can tell you the growth and the change and the impact have been amazing. The first three or four years, it felt like I wasn't achieving nothing besides personal satisfaction. So compounded growth requires for you to be consistent and realize that there is no such thing as a magic lesson. There's no secret peel. There's no golden nugget. There's no hidden magic. None of that stuff exists. It's about compounding. And in compounding, you're going to have ups and downs. There's going to be days you're successful and there's going to be days you fail. And this gets into the next point where court wants to take over. Yeah, so I might get in trouble for this one, but we're going to say it anyway. This is how we get down. Um, the word fairness is a very controversial word because fairness that's created within a system, most systems create equity, meaning they create a fair organization. Um, they have different rules to keep things fair. But the truth is fairness is a myth. Life was never meant to be fair. So if you are a leader or an entrepreneur or a change maker or anything that's on the edge of society, that's pushing society forward, you have to ditch the idea of fairness. It doesn't, it doesn't work. As a, as a leader, you have to take radical responsibility for everything that happens. Because life was never meant to be fair. Our job is, as a culture is to create what we want. And everything on the outside of that is obstacles. So if if you're five foot two and the person six foot two and a wall is seven foot, the five foot two person may say, well, life's not fair. No, just learn how to jump higher. Learn how to jump higher or go get a tool, go get a ladder, go get something to offset where you're deficient so you can achieve the, the same goal. But a lot of us get stuck at fairness. But when, when you decide to take radical responsibility for everything around you, you're not waiting anymore for somebody to hand you something or to give you something. You're going to get it. And if you're deciding to create or to curate your culture um, and drive them to a higher place, then as a leader, you got to remove that idea that life is meant to be fair because fairness doesn't exist. And radical responsibility is a game changer for your psychology. So let me, let me tie that bit to um, compounding. So this also destroys compounded growth. In compounded growth, um, let's say you have an uptime and a downtime. If the downtime happens and you blame somebody else, you don't get the lesson that allows you to compound the experiences to become that wiser person and on the context of your journey. What happens is by you blaming other people, you're losing so many powerful lessons you can lose. Radical responsibility says, if something happens to you, whether it's your fault or not, it's still your responsibility. And so if you're compounding that process, well, we often see something that destroys compounded growth in the process of, of going through compounded growth is when they get to a stage that they don't like, they blame. And so then they lose the experiences. This is how you can be in business for 15, 20 years and still not be very wise. Why? Because you blamed others. So it's critical to take full response. It's a lot. And it's a, it's a friction space that going to make, like you say, it's not going to make you feel comfortable. But this journey of being an entrepreneur does require you to develop a healthy relationship with grit and friction, which, by the way, you can practice that in safe ways. Um, so let's keep going on that one. Now, <clears throat> here's another trick. Here's another secret. Jumping now, we're going to jump subjects. You cannot solely rely on rationality to solve problems in an irrational market. The business market, the market investment, all these markets are totally irrational. Why are they irrational? They're not really irrational. They're irrational because, remember, the separation of beliefs. So when you push a product into the market, the market is totally irrational to you. Yet you rely upon the rationality that's gotten you this far to go move forward in business. You can't do it. Doesn't work. This is one of our failures. So 
Let me give you an example. One of the reasons we see a lot of intelligent people don't do well in business because intelligence have made them popular in their media circle. But when you decide to move a product out of, outside of your 150 media circle to a larger audience, they don't share your rationality. And so what's critical in this case is in order for you to move a product or service amongst other people who don't share your rationality, you have to use mental models and principles to navigate that, that task. Otherwise, what you'll find is quite often what's compromising you is not the way the market is showing up. It's your relationship and your personalization to your rationalization. This is why a lot of intelligent people come out of school do so bad in business because they built so much personal status and value around their intelligence that when they go into the market, it's hard for them to let their, it's hard for their ego to let it go and accept the broadness and diversity of thoughts and ideas, i.e. Blackberry, i.e. a lot of consumers. There's a lot of companies that fail because they had a very, very narrow um, 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 idea of rationality. So remember, when you're doing business, sitting around a room, um, um, patting everybody on the shoulders about who are less, more or less, more rational, or what you would do if you was in this position is a waste of time. Next one. Mm. Go ahead, Court. Also, so if you want value, give value. So one of the things that I feel like is is, is troubling in today's society is this boss culture. Boss culture says, I'm a boss. I, don't, I quit my job so I can be a boss. Um, boss this, boss that. The reason why that's dangerous and it's not a winning formula is because generating revenue, large amounts and scaling a business comes from the amount of service you can provide to your customers. How much value you give, meaning you have to be palms up, willing to serve your customers at, at all times and give value. So if you want to receive value, the law of reciprocation states that because law of reciprocation is at work at all times. So anything you want, you have to give. So you can't expect, expect to gain long term value from anything without the exchange of that perceived value from the customers or from you. So you have to be so. If you want to build or grow or build any kind of platform, it all starts with a being of service and, and value that you can give to your customers. So this is so it's this idea of the, of the uh, elevator, and it's, just, it's it's called elevator theory, and this kind of help you really wrap your mind around this phrase. If you walk into an elevator and you smile, nine times out of ten, people will smile back. If you walk into an elevator and you snarl. More, nine times out of 10, people frown or snarl back. And if you walk into the elevator and you do nothing, nine times out of 10, people will do nothing. The world is the way it is because of the way you show up to the world. If the world's beautiful, it's how you're showing up. If the world's dark and ugly, well, pause, I, the word dark, I don't want to be very careful with the word dark for historical reasons. But if the world's ugly to you, then in a sense, that's how you're showing up. At the end of the day, whatever world you experience is how you show up to the world. And by you thinking the world you're entitled to receive, even though you, you don't pour anything into the world, is a distortion. I'm going to keep going. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Of course. Mm -hmm. um, so also in this world of motivational speakers, you know, motivation is a whole section in libraries and bookstores about motivation. A lot of motivational stuff don't work. Why? because motivation is limit, has its limits, it, it does, it's not enough. Motivation is at the foundation of who you are as a human in terms of your drive to do some things bigger than yourself. But when you, when you have to, like Nana mentioned earlier, because this is, we're playing a compounding game, if you have to wake up every day and go to the gym every day for 365 days a year and then do it again year two, in year three, in year five, in year seven, in year 10, in year 15, motivation ain't enough. So, so it has to be more than motivation. It has to be purpose driven. And if you are, if you can find your purpose, then that will supersede motivations in them times where you don't feel like getting up or when it gets hard or when you're going through those cycles where things are good and then it's bad, things is great and then it's tough. When those tough times, you don't necessarily feel motivated. So what else is there that you can pull on, that you can draw on, that can still peel you out of bed to achieve the same result at the end of that day? And that's and that's purpose. But I, I, we want to iterate the fact that 
do not rely just on motivation. That's only a three, five percent boost at certain times to help you get there. It's like going to a seminar one day. You'll get excited, but it's one day. It's still more to it. Beautiful. Next, we go next one. Um, be careful with all this dialogue around goals. <clears throat> In our class, we we tell folks that um, we should view business plans with business plans. Um, that goals <laughs> goals are extremely dangerous. Um, you have to see goals as um, a hypothesis or of the future or a, um, it could be a plan, but once you discover more information, you should be able to pivot on a drop of a dime. So what I mean by this is that quite often, <clears throat> some people become so goal focused. When they achieve their goal, they lost their family. When they achieve their goal, they lost their husband and wife. They achieve their goal, they don't have their children anymore. They achieve their goal, they don't have their health. You have to learn goal, goal thinking is a blinder. And all, a lot of people talk about vision boards and goal. And don't get me wrong, I'm not demonizing those things. I don't think they, I have it, they have their place. They're just over amplified. And the reality is that when you first start a business, the one of the reasons you can't write a good business plan is you never did it before. That should be, that's something you should accept. When you started, when you start your business for the first time, you're going to be ignorant. You're going to be ignorant of the process. And you're going to learn through the process. You're not going to wake up one day or listen to a conversation or talk to a mentor. And all of a sudden, you know what to do. It's going to be a, it's a consistent path of curiosity and discovery. And through that process and through compounding, you will grow into it. Next one. Go ahead, Court. I think we can, this one, we... We talked about compounding, right? Life is a practice. So there, you'll never finish learning. I think the point that I want to make here is that uh, certain life paths require never ending learning. And you are all most are, are on it. Most of the people that are listening to this are on that path. So there's not there's no degree that can cover everything you need to be successful for the rest of your life. So even after your degrees, after your experience, you have to be constantly learning, reading, growing, upgrading your software for the rest of your life. That's your path. That's what you committed to. Don't deify intelligence. Um, in this, in, in the entrepreneur world, it's about learning. It's 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 about the ability to learn uh, because your intelligence often represents your previous experiences. Quite often, doesn't represent experiences you know the, the new experiences that you're going to walk into. Um, don't mistake the proxy for the underlying variable. I'm moving a little bit faster because I want to leave room for questions. Um, the proxy is this. Um, for example, in the black community, we get really excited around voting. But many of us don't realize that the underlying variable is still being untouched, the issue at hand. So if we don't own the issue at hand, which requires, you know, in order to really vote, we would have to treat it like sports. We would have to watch shows on every week and watch all the players and details, get their stats, their performance. Uh, understand the processes that how things move, understand causation, understand structural, structural development, understand governance. But in the end, we get really, really excited about the proxy of voting. The same thing happens in business. Sometimes we're really excited about the product we're about to sell, and we forget the customer buying our product to have a certain emotional experience. So when you, if I ask you what business you're in, you're not in the business of selling the jars of jelly. You're in, you're in, a, you're in the business of happiness. And anybody who's in that same business is your possible competitor. I'm keep going faster, faster. Mm -hmm. Um, that's I think that's yours, Court. Yeah. So you don't learn. You won't learn it unless you do it. So there's a big difference between vocabulary and skill. So a lot of people will spend their whole lives learning the vocabulary of something, which makes them sound so intelligent and so knowledgeable and so experienced because they spent time on the vocabulary. And then there's others who just spent time learning the skill and they may not have the vo vocabulary. That's that's where it becomes dangerous, because a lot of times we'll get captivated by people with great, articulate, elegant vocabulary who have no skill. And that's how our culture can get derailed. Business can get derailed. Anything can get derailed based on us being caught in caught in the hypnosis of somebody who has the vocabulary of a thing. Understand this. Focus on doing it, practicing it, 
doing it. Not, if you read a book, go apply the book to yourself. If you hear a theory or a strategy in business, go experiment with that theory. That's the only way you're going to get better. And it's easy to sit back and practice the vocabulary, but it's a whole different thing when, in terms of do you know how to do it? It's like reading a book on how to play golf. And then when you get out there and you realize how complex it is, you, you'd rather just go back home and learn how to play golf. how to play golf somewhere. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, golf is, man. <laughs> um, diversity. So often we get, we get this language about diversity. We've been doing a lot of work with, around diversity. And um, diversity is an excellent business strategy. We're not, why, now let's go back into where we're going with this. Remember, the world is not a rational market because there's multiple beliefs. So to the individual, it feels irrational. So if your business, if you want to be able to solve complex problems, you need a, you need a diversity of thinking. People with different backgrounds, different experiences to apply their intelligence to solving a problem, which then broadens your creativity and your decision making as a business. So as a business, the reason you want diverse forms of beliefs in your company is because it will broaden your ability to navigate a world that's totally irrational. Where we go wrong with diversity is we treat diversity as um, seats in the chair of different races. And ultimately what we do is because we don't see them as, um, uh, we, don't argue the, we don't argue the value of the seat, the people sitting in the chair, we end up tokenizing the individuals and we lower the esteem of the high performers in the company who might be of the same race. So imagine if you're a white woman or a white male and somebody tells you, oh, I'm not gonna hire a person next to you because they bring a high value to the company. I'm buying this person because I have to fill a quota. So the reality is that the argument around diversity is that if you change the argument towards let's extract the best out of these brains to solve these complex problems, you keep the morale high, you keep the strength of the team strong, and you make the people who sit in those chairs of different backgrounds feel valuable. The reason they don't feel valuable to be seen, because quite often they sit in the chair and still got to follow that same narrow model, which was comes from, it comes from a belief system that they didn't create or they have no impact upon. Um, and with that being said, I think, what I'm saying, I think we have, um, oh, the obvious is not obvious. Uh, I kind of went into this earlier um, that ultimately um, that we develop our beliefs from being in the same clubs. Um, we watch the same media sources. We have the same feedback loops in life. And we even defend those ideas, right? So then that creates our bubble effect. So what is obvious to us is not necessarily obvious to other people. And that's a good thing once you learn that. But if you don't learn that, it's hard to know that, especially with algorithms being pushed towards you to reinforce your 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 limiting beliefs. Uh, moving really fast. Be careful labels. Labels lock you into your belief system. So as a knowledge worker, I can't label myself. I mean, I'm, okay, I'm African, uh, African-American, so I, I accept that label. But even then, I have to think outside my label. But sometimes we buy, buy into these labels, and when you buy into these labels so richly, they almost lock you into a group of beliefs. Learn to think outside of your labels. So whatever you label yourself as, fine. Learn to think outside your labels and learn to think in the shoes of those who don't agree with your label. If you do that, I promise you it will open up and the world becomes more beautiful. It doesn't become uglier. You'll realize that most people mean good. They just have some time flawed rationalization or they may have a different rationalization, but most people are good. Um, stories versus optionality. Be careful with stories. So the way we... The way we spread the disease of our personal beliefs, this is this is how you create the school fish effect or um, when everybody believes in an idea but no one can prove it, is the way we spread it so fast is through stories. As an entrepreneur that runs my company, when somebody tells a story, when they try to make a point, I remove the story from my thoughts and I'm more focused on optionality. I mean that when you tell me what whatever you're trying to share with me, I look at what are my options, what options am I gaining and what options am I losing? If you learn to think through optionality and lower the value of stories in your process of thinking when you're running a company, this is not for everybody. This is for people who run companies. It will give you, um, it will give you more control of your navigation. But if you start to lock into stories, what you'll find is the squeaky wheel will get the oil, and quite often it's the minority that's driving the majority. Moving fast. Um, mm -hmm. Go ahead, Court. Uh, um, so the word independent means by yourself. So the whole solo solo entrepreneur concept is to me 
filled with flaws. You cannot build something. You cannot build something without a team. Uh, we're, we're, in, we're in the Bay, we're from Oakland. You know, of course, you've been brought up with that whole independent mindset, right? But as an entrepreneur who wants to build and scale, you need people. So it's a synergistic approach that you have to choose in order to create a multiplier for yourself in, in business. It's power in people. So it's, it, so once you uh, grasp the idea that it's power in people, then synergy happens. And when two people, three people, four people come together on an idea or a project, that's where your four and five, six X's come because the, I, the energy and the ideas that come that you couldn't have thought of yourself starts to happen in that company or in that that idea. So we have to squash the whole idea of being independent or doing it all yourself because it, it's, it's, it's very limited in its approach. So with that being said, I hope we, we were able to help you understand the importance of you have to understand, shape, and reframe your beliefs. At the very core of, of going from being um, an employee or changing mm -hmm. life or transitioning in life, if you don't reshape your beliefs, there is no transitioning. Quite often, the complexity around transitioning is the divorce and letting go of the old beliefs for the new beliefs. And for a human being, that's not very comfortable. You burn a lot of calories based on neuroscience when that happens, and it's totally understandable. And there's no flaws in you. There's nothing wrong with you. It's just part of our human nature. We weren't built for a world of 8 billion people. We were built for groups of 150. So quite often, when we're challenged with some of these challenges, it's very uncomfortable for us. And so in your transitioning, um, it's a very... Space, it's a space of uncertainty, and the brain hates uncertainty, right? So at the end of the day, just know that at the core of change, the core challenge is always going to be your beliefs and your mental models. Um, and with that being said, stay, stay, stay in order to change, stay curious, learn first principle thinking, which is learn to pay attention to your assumptions. I heard a scientist say the other day that science would never 100% know everything because it has too many assumptions built into the model of science itself. And so in order for you to actually solve complex problems and produce high levels of cre um, creativity, learn to challenge your assumptions. And then last is that if you want to get a chance to do some observations, watch the gap between your belief systems and your children's belief systems. It's the most amazing thing ever if you want to watch the actual um, uh, actual sample of how belief systems work. Or if you have a niece, a nephew, or a family friend, just watch, like talk to the child and watch the elementary stages of their belief systems. It's absolutely amazing. So with that being said, whew, we went quick. I like took three months and put it in 45 minutes. Is there any questions? <laughs> we have pause here. Three months. Trust me, in three months, we really go into this. Thank you. Thank you. We're good. We'll give them three, we give them three more minutes to let people process the speed of this, this presentation. And if there's anything else in, in the next two or three minutes, if there's nothing else, we'll, we'll go ahead and check out. But we want to say thank you for having us. Um, this was a hell of experience. Um, you know, we, we, Mills is down the street from us and, and we care about the work they're doing. Um, so just want to say greatly thank you. Thank you for having us. Yeah, appreciate it.